Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Nassad Dada and Woody Foster. Nassad Dada is the founder and lead investigator of the Mosquito Microbiome Consortium. This is a collaborative initiative to advance mosquito microbiome research in an effort to further our understanding of the role of the microbiome in mosquito biology and its possible importance in developing mosquito-borne disease interventions. While she was at the U.S. Centers of Disease Control not long ago, she and Audrey Lenhart made some very interesting and important observations regarding the influence of the microbiome on important mosquito phenotypes, such as insecticide resistance. Woody Foster is Professor Emeritus at The Ohio State University. Woody's expertise is in the areas of behavior, physiology, and behavioral ecology of arthropod vectors of vertebrate pathogens. His research has included field and laboratory studies of bed bugs, blood-sucking maggots, dung flies, ticks, spiders, fleas, sand flies, tsetse flies, and mosquitoes. He has interest in the nutritional ecology of African malaria vectors, their attraction to volatile plant compounds, and their host preferences. Woody's interest in the nutritional ecology of mosquitoes and mosquito-plant interactions is particularly relevant when thinking about pollination services mosquitoes and the African malaria vector in particular may provide. Well, we're really happy to have you both joining us today. Thanks a lot for your participation. Nisai, you're going to be the first of our speakers today. Thank you. And thanks for that introduction and for inviting me to speak about mosquito microbe interactions and what these interactions may mean for gene drives. I would like to highlight here that this is largely to explore what we currently know about mosquito microbe interactions. And, um, and then begin to ask questions about how they may um, impact or have implications for gene drives. So I will go ahead and stop my video now so we can focus on the presentation. Great, so mosquitoes, like any living organism, have all microbes, and these microbes inhabit different uh, tissues of the mosquitoes. These include the internal organs, like the crop, the salivary glands, the meat gut, the ovaries, and uh, the mouth egan tubules, as well as their uh, cuticle surface. There are also some microbes that inhabit mosquito cells, and these are um, intracellular microbes, as well as those that live outside of mosquito cells. And we'll see later on how does different kinds of microbes affect or impact mosquito biology. So these microbes comprise genetic material or uh, their genome, which together influence or form a genetic pool or metagenome that influence the mosquito biology. And um, I thought that before we dive into how these microbes or metagenomes influence the mosquito microbiology, we could look at where these microbes come from. They are primarily acquired from larval breeding sites and to a lesser extent transferred from adult females to her eggs particularly the intercellular uh, microbes like Wolbachia or, and or Spiroplasma. And they are also transferred across the four level stages from pupae and from pupae to adults. The adults acquire these microbes during feeding, particularly during nectar feeding. And I think that this might have um, uh, important implications for nectar feeding and pollination that Woody would be talking to us about later on. So how do these microbes affect the mosquito biology? And I thought that before we dive into exploring uh, that question, I would um, orient us to the different kinds of microbes available and how much we know about them. I can tell you that despite lots of research done in this area of mosquito biology, we still 
do not know much about them. Up until recently, a majority of the work done on mosquito microbe interactions have, fo have largely focused on characterizing the microbial components and uh, and these studies have focused largely on the bacterial and archaeal component, neglecting the protozoans, the fungi, the viruses, and the and the phages. So, with the advent of um, advanced molecular tools, that is changing. We're beginning to see more studies that are considering the functions of these different types of uh, of microbes. So. Uh, during this talk, I would do my best to highlight these different categories and how they affect um, the mosquito biology, but bear in mind that a majority of uh, published material are focused on the bacterial and archaeal component. For each category, I thought that I would um, I would focus on key research and or review papers that, act, that, that at, at least summarize key findings over the years. And this is by no means an exhaustive list of literature. Rather, I would ask you to consider them a starting point for exploring how micro, microbes affect each of these key muscular characteristics. I will focus, obviously, on the three, um, on the three uh, genera of uh, mosquito vectors, as well as these six key life properties of mosquitoes, including the ecology, their growth and development, reproduction, metabolism, specifically uh, sugar and blood meal metabolism, yeah, responsiveness or immunity um, within the context of pathogen transmission, as well as evolution, genetics, and um, horizontal gene transfer. So first up is ecology, and there is repeated evidence of spatial temporal variation in mosquito microbiota that are associated with uh, ecological factors. Here I highlight three uh, papers looking at Culex, Anopheles, as well as Aedes. In the first paper here on Culex nigripalpus, we see that the microbiota varies by location. And these are samples that were collected from three different locations across Florida. And on the on the right hand side of the of the slide, I show key findings from this study where they looked at the microbial composition across the different the three different locations that they sampled. On panel A here, they looked at the phylogenetic relationship of the different uh, uh, microbes identified, as well as the abundance of each microbial taxa. And we can see here that these microbes cluster very distinctly away from one another and um, into the different collection locations. The dots here represent specific microbial taxa. And these were largely bacterial taxa that separated these uh, um, mosquitoes into three different categories. On this other panel here, it's a similar it's a similar output, but they only focus on the phylogenetic relationships between the identified um, bacterial microbial communities. And here we see that even though they do cluster by the different locations, there is some overlap between the two. Uh, locations largely driven by um, similar bacterial taxa across those locations. And here they do quantify the differences between the phylogenetic diversity across the different locations. And we see that this uh, separate very uh, distinctly with those collected from Vera Beach being less diverse compared to those uh, collected from Palmetto Coast. In Anopheles colutsi, we see a similar pattern. Here, the authors looked at differences across different geographical locations in Mali, as well as different seasons. So here is also um, a principal component analysis delineating the uh, mosquitoes by their microbial composition. And the, and the blue 
and orange um, group here represent the Sahel, the Sahel location, but two different, se uh, two different uh, seasons, the, the wet season in blue and the, and the dry season in, in orange. And we see that although they do cluster separately, there is some overlap representing uh, their common location. Um, in the other locations, we see in the riparian um, wet and dry seasons, we also see delineation by location, but little overlap across the two seasons. And then this brown one here represents samples that were collected from the lab, and they also cluster distinctly away from those um, collected from different locations, from the other different locations. Here they also highlight specific uh, microbes that are causing this separation in, um, in microbial uh, composition or this separation on the principal component analysis. I won't go into uh, too much detail, but I just wanted to highlight that although they may seem distinct, that there are several um, microbes driving the separation and not necessarily the entire microbial composition. One thing that I thought I also found interesting in this study is that they characterize the blood meal sauce. And we can see here that despite um, this being the same uh, mosquito species and um, having hopefully having similar uh, behaviors, we see that they do have different, different blood meal sources. Although a majority of the blood meal came from humans, we do see some variation uh, with feeding on largely domestic animals, which adds another layer of complexity to um, how the ecology might affect the mosquito microbiota. And here in Aedes albopictus, we also see um, similar patterns. First of all, I'll go to the principal component analysis plot here where we see mosquitoes from different locations that cluster distinctly according to their um, locations with different microbes responsible. The dots there show the, uh, uh, highlight the different microbes that are responsible for the different clustering pattern. They also looked at the type an abundance of uh, microbial taxa across the different locations. And they also found differences in um, how, how much, how many, and what type of uh, microbes were present in this different location. One thing that I'd like to point out here in this uh, study is that they focused on the fungal community rather than the bacterial community, and they focused on the effect of uh, inv invasion on the mosquito com uh, composition. So they found that mosquitoes that were um, local to uh, this country showed higher diversity compared to those that were invasive in France. So here uh, in Vietnam and in Madagascar, they had na natural populations of Aedes albopictus while well. in France, these are considered invasive species. So um, next up next is uh, is growth, and we see recent evidence, or not not so recent anymore, show that mosquitoes rely on their gut microbiota for uh, development, and it does not matter what kind of microbe, as we will see in upcoming slides, as long as there are microbes present in their breeding habitat or their source of food that's necessary for the development. So here, first of all, this I think this was one of the seminal studies on the effect of uh, microbes on mosquito development. In panel A here, we see that they um, characterized the effect of uh, bacteria on the development of two of three different uh, mosquito species. They looked at Aedes aegypti, they looked at uh, Geogagra, I can say this, Geo, uh, yeah, Atropalpus and Anopheles gambi. And um, you will notice that the first bar here is missing and that's the azenic um, 
as an example, these were um, mosquito samples that were not given any bacteria. So all of the eggs were surface sterilized to remove any microbial uh, content prior to the experiment. And then they had three treatments, one without bacteria, one with bacteria, and one with a non-sterile environment. And you can see here that the um, isenic or no bacterial treatment was significantly different from the bacteria or non-sterile non -sterile, um, uh, test across the three different species that were tested. And there were no significant differences between the, um, the tests that contained either bacteria or that were non-sterile. So here they tested individual mosquito uh, tax, individual microbial taxa to see whether or not there were specific effects, whether or not specific uh, microbial taxa had effects on the development of uh, mosquitoes. And they found, again, that the azanic mosquitoes did not survive until adulthood. They reported that these ones did not um, develop beyond the first level insta uh, stage. They also showed the same the same effect with heat killed uh, microbes, and um, also with bacteria conditioned um, substrates or food. And that is uh, uh, food or substrates that contained bacterial components, inactivated bacterial components. So they looked at different microbial taxa and out of all of the different taxa tested they found that microbacteria had similar effects to the azanic heat killed or bacteria conditioned um, tests. They also looked at development over time and they found no difference for all of this bacterial taxa that was able to restore development in, in the different mosquito species. They followed this up to, uh, with um, additional studies on more mosquito species. Here you, you'll see that they included Aedes albopictus, Kilex kinky, Fasciatus from, from the field, as well as uh, laboratory colonies. This time around, rather than looking at specific or individual microbial taxa, they utilize microbial communities from either the field or from um, laboratory rearing water. So they had um, four different tests, one with sterile water only. And you can see here that none of the microbes with sterile water, uh, none of the uh, mosquitoes with sterile water survived or um, developed. And those that were fed or um, that were read in lab culture spiked water developed. Those that were um, read in field water spiked field uh, spiked water also developed, and as well as those that were uh, read in E. coli uh, su uh, treated substrate. There were no significant or uh, variation. There was significant variation between these three. Sorry, there was significant variation between the three um, uh, bacterial community treatment, but uh, significant differences between the sterile water treatment and each of these three different treatments. So they also looked at those that developed following following um, the bacterial community treatment, and they found that regardless of the type of, um, regardless of the type of uh, uh, water treatment that they received, the mosquitoes developed. And with only two laboratory colonies where they found significant differences between the lab and the field, field culture water treatment. So next is another study looking at the effect of uh, specific uh, microbes on the uh, uh, larval size or development of Anopheles, Anopheles gambi larvae. Here they show that there is an increase in, 
developmental rate when additional bacteria uh, introduced into the microbes and here they did add they did um, test azia and um, following um, they did infect they did conduct experiment testing the effect of azia on the development of anopheles gambi larva following egg hatching so here we see um, the treated samples with azia these are the large larvae here and the untreated uh control 76 hours and 96 hours post hatching and they highlighted that the differences in in um in development was really significant at day six all the larva that were treated with azia did uh, develop to adults well at least there were pupae while those that were not treated with azire remained at the third insta stage they went on to look at the um, transcriptomic profiles of this different uh, treatments and they found upregulation of genes involved in uh, cuticle formation and this may be um, responsible for the differences in developmental rate between Azia treated and untreated mosquitoes. So next is um, reproduction. So we have studies showing that uh, the mosquito microbiota or microbes does affect uh, reproduction. And here again, I also try to identify examples from Aedes, Anopheles, and Culex. In the first study here, they looked at um, they looked at uh, the effect of autogeny, the effect of the microbiome on reproduction in an autogenous and autogenous uh, mosquito species. And they, uh, for the uh, autogenous species, they looked at Aedes aegypti and Aedes atropopus for the anatogenous um, representative. So in panel A here, they looked at the number of females that produce at least one mature egg. And regardless of the type of uh, bacterial treatment, they found that uh, all of the Aedes, Aedes mosquitoes or the autogenous mosquitoes or representative did produce at least one mature egg. And when they looked at those that do not require uh, fertilization or do not re require blood meal for egg development, they found they found that this effect varied by different kinds of uh, microbes. And looking at the mature um, egg clutch size in the ovary as well as the mature eggs laid. Again, here we see that um, regardless of the kind of uh, bacteria treated, uh, regardless of the kind of bacterial treatment, that there was no difference between uh, the egg clutch size or the number of mature eggs laid in Aedes aegypti compared to Atropophis, where, um, where the effect varied depending on the type of bacteria. They also looked at the number of eggs laid per female. And similarly, in Aedes aegypti, they found no difference across the different bacterial types I tested and found significant differences um, between the different bacteria tested using uh, tested on Aedes atropalpus. And this they concluded that there is a significant uh, difference between the effect of the microbiota on reproduction, uh, which is associated with whether or not the muscular species is autogenous. Next, we, uh, next, uh, this uh, authors looked at the effect of different bacteria on um, attraction by gravid anopheles gambi. And they tested two different bacterial species. They looked at, uh, Pantea stewarti, as well as um, Elizabeth Kingia meningoseptica. 
And here, they looked at bacteria treated and untreated samples for each uh, treatment or each type of experiment. And they found that for both treated samples, they had a higher attraction. Um, sorry, yes, they had a higher attraction by um, they had a higher attraction by the specific microbes, but the difference was significantly um, higher in those that were treated or exposed to um, P. stewarti. And they um, attributed this to the emission of uh, volatiles. They found that P. stewarti did emit indole and 3-methylbutanol, while meningius um, Elizabeth Kingia meningius septica only emitted indole and it is likely that the com combination of these two um, volatiles um, contributed to the higher attri attractiveness found in P. stewarti compared to Meningo septica. So next uh, is a study done on Kilex pipients where they also tested different microbes and uh, uh, using oviposition preference assays. And they found that mosquitoes were more attracted to uh, bacteria-treated bacteria uh, substrates compared to those treated with either yeast, the microalgae, or with uh, nothing. So here is a pie chart of um, the proportion of mosquitoes that were attracted to the different types of bacterial taxa that they uh, used in their assay. So you can see here that no slice was uh, attributed to the yeast or micro, uh, micro algae or control. Next up is metabolism. And I tried to highlight uh, two studies looking at uh, sugar metabolism as well as blood meal metabolism for the sugar metabolism, the authors focused on Aedes albopictus, and they characterized microbes, live microbes involved in fructose metabolism. And this represents the first of this kind of study on mosquitoes. They looked at um, 24 hours post feeding and identified several bacterial and fungal taxa involved in fructose metabolism. Here we see the most abundant taxa depicted by the size of markers, the pink, pink round markers for microbes identified in female mosquitoes and the green triangular markers for those from male mosquitoes. And while several of these um, microbes, like this one's, are identified in both males and female. There were several microbes that were uh, strongly associated with either sex, and I identify, uh, I highlight those with this red um, arrows here. So I'd like to highlight here that this is one of the studies where, in addition to looking at the bacterial component of the uh, mosquito microbiota, they also looked at the fungal component as well. So here is um, another study on this time on Anopheles colutsi and on blood meal metabolism. And the authors investigated the gut epithelial response to the changing microbiota load upon blood feeding in, um, in Anopheles. They showed that the synthesis and integrity of the peritrophic membrane, which physically separates the gut, epithelium from its content is microbiota dependent. And panel A here shows the effect of antibiotic treatment on overall bacterial load. Here we see that bacterial load decreased up to 96 hours post blood meal. They um, exposed them to at least two blood meals and post antibiotic treatment while the controls that didn't receive any antibiotic treatment remained high the entire time. Focusing on four putative genes that encode components of the peritrophic membrane in panel B here, we see that all four are consistently upregulated in um, the controls compared to the antibiotic treatment 
tree type mosquitoes. Panel C here shows the peritropic membrane of blood fed mosquitoes with and uh, without antibiotics. And we see that with antibiotics, there is a disruption of, uh, of that membrane as um, indicated by the white arrows here. And on the, in the controls where no antibiotic was administered, we see that the, the membrane is, is intact, which is um, evidence that the microbiota does mediate the synthesis and um, maintains the integrity of this membrane, particularly um, following blood meal. So next up is um, looking at responsiveness to, in particular, to pathogen transmission. And here I highlight two really nice um, reviews of, um, of the situation in, um, with arboviruses and, and uh, the Anopheles plasmodium system. So uh, looking at arboviruses, the authors provide a very comprehensive summary of how mosquito microbiome or microbiota mediates host response to uh, arbovirus infection. On the top panel here, they show that the level microbiota can influence um, adult, comp uh, adult uh, vector competence or the ability to acquire and transmit, acquire, incubate and transmit uh, Arboviruses, and they show that or indicate that rearing mosquitoes with either um, Enterobacteriaceae isolate or Salmonella uh, species differentially affects their susceptibility to dengue virus infections at the adult stage. So here we see that those that were red with only Enterobacteriaceae isolate have um, a lower susceptibility to dengue, while those that were red with salmonella have a higher susceptibility to, to dengue. In panel B here, they show that the presence of the gut microbiota can influence um, uh, a viral infection. So in the yellow patch here, is the um, microbiota of mosquitoes without antibiotic treatment and in the blue patch, blue or gray patch, depending on what color you see here is um, for those with antibiotic treatment. And they show that in Anopheles gambi, where, where, where the microbiota is, is cleared by antibiotic treatment, they are less effective host to onion, onion yang virus compared to those with the uh, microbiota intact. And then in panel C, they show that the microbiota does stimulate the muscular immune system and it moderates arbovirus um, infections. They, um, they show that the microbiota induces the toll and the IMD pathway activity and this IMD uh, activity does uh, control or hinder infection with synbis uh, viruses and prevents uh, additional microbial uh, development. They also show that the fungus Valveria bassiana activates the toll and jack start pathway and is also responsible for reduced infection with uh, dengue virus. In panel D here, they show that infection with um, other viruses, including Zika and uh, West Nile virus can alter the mosquito microbiome composition. So looking at um, the uh, Anopheles plasmodium, specifically at the Anopheles plasmodium system. Here is another nice uh, summary of the process in the, uh, uh, the Here's another nice summary of the process. Here the authors show that bacterial growth affect um, following blood meal 
triggers the immune response to activate um, the synthesis of antimicrobial peptides and uh, immune uh, immune response and these infectors target bacterial populations in the mosquito mid gut and exert antiparasitic effects. Next, they um, show that entero, enterobacter strain, specific enter, a specific enterobacter strain from Anopheles um, arabiensis affects plasmodium development in the muscular gut through elevated um, ROS or ROS um, um, pathways. And third, um, they show that the microbiota is uh, um, the microbiota is, re is responsible for immune priming upon um, plasmodium infection and this affects mosquitoes from uh, subsequent infections and is likely to mediate hemocyte um, hemocyte differentiation. So in a recent talk during the Johns Hopkins Walt Malaria Day, um, one of the authors, one of the speakers during that talk, talk did mention that this immune priming in response to plasmodium infection is um is heritable i don't think that work is published because i tried to to find it to share it here but didn't find it and next uh last but not the least is um effects of microbes on the um evolution or genetics of the host and here is i highlight a nice review on um, specifically on horizontal gene transfer between microbes and mosquitoes. The authors report that viral DNA fragments, including upper viral DNA, have been detected with remarkable frequency in mosquito cells and mosquitoes. And in this table, they summarize studying, stu different studies showing this e event. In the third column here, we can see that this has been reported in all three um, genera of mosquito vectors, but a majority of this has been through in silico or computational research. The arrows here on the left hand side of the slide highlight the different types of studies. Those that they categorize as group A were on mosquitoes and mosquito cells, while those uh, are categorized as group B where on um where done using computational tools and uh, newer studies however are now focusing on characterizing this horizontally transpired uh, genes or acquired genes in mosquitoes and particularly ex extending the work in this area to the functional characterization of these genes because in the past it's been debatable whether this um, horizontal gene transfer between uh, microbes and mosquitoes is real and whether or not the transfer genes are functional. So uh, there are implications of these interactions for gene drives. I think that we can begin to explore. I don't have the answer, but I thought that we might recall the key gene drive approaches which involve um, population repress, uh, population replacement and or uh, with um, uh, refractory mosquitoes and or population suppression and or elim elimination. And we can see that these two approaches do um, cut across the different or encompass the different key life properties key mosquito life properties as, and we've, we've recently we've just seen that the microbes that microbes do affect each of these key life properties so i think that this is something that we should we should begin to explore i tried to find studies on um gene drives that looked at the effect on uh the microbiota or the effect of the microbiota on um the modified mosquitoes, but I am not aware of 
any. I would be happy to, if, if anyone is aware of any, I would be happy to read that. But I'd like to leave you with this summary that even though it looks like we have done a lot of work on uh, mosquito microbe interactions, that we still know very little about these interactions and how they impact mosquito biology. And I think that it's important that we should also consider how these interactions might affect or be affected by, by gene drives. So to end and um, also turn over to Woody, I would like to acknowledge the authors of all of the studies that I have summarized. I hope that I've done them uh, justice. So Woody, the floor is all yours. All right. Um, this is a rather strange topic, uh, but an important one because we're looking at uh, the possibility of non-target uh, organisms. And I will say right from the start that I've been uh, pushing for this idea for a long time. I think it's finally firmly in place now is that mosquitoes really have two hosts by and large, and one is vertebrates for their blood and vascular plants for their sugar. Uh, what's unusual for me is that like most typical medical entomologists, we think about what the plant can do for the mosquito and particularly how it indirectly affects pathogen transmission, either through affecting for, for, uh, survival or fecundity or perhaps directly on the pathogen itself in various ways. And that's how we normally think of it. But today we're talking about what the mosquito does for the plant. And in particular, uh, how it might be helping to pollinate the plants. Now, just a brief, a brief uh, overview of the biology. Here's the sort of arc typical type of flower, which has a female part and some male parts. Usually if cross pollination is going to be taking place, the either the male part or the female part matures first to prevent selfing. But selfing goes on as well in many plants because plants are crazy and do all kinds of things. But just to get the general idea, the insect is there basically to get at the nectar, which is somewhere usually in a receptacle down in this area, depending on the construction of the flower. Now the best pollinators, and we have to hold insects of all kinds, particularly mosquitoes to fairly high standard here. And if, First of all, of course, they have to be able to pick up pollen and drop it off at various flowers. And they should also move among flowers fairly frequently. Now, a really good pollinator visits only one plant species, or at least only one in one foraging bout, at least, and that's called flower constancy, so that pollen is not being wasted as the insect goes from one flower to another of an entirely different plant species. And to make it even a tighter connection between the plant and the pollinator, it would be nice if the plant has no other visitors other than the, the, the um, specialist insect in this case, and the plant itself is a specialist. So it just uh, typical pollinators that we're all familiar with are, are bees, but also butterflies and moths, beetles and flies. These are all considered to be good or at least moderate pollinators in some kinds of pollinating systems. The honeybee is of course famous if one third of the American diet is dependent uh, on the honeybee either directly or indirectly for agriculture. 
Then, of course, at the other extreme, we have the cheaters. And these are the worst pollinators. Uh, here's a, a bumblebee, a native bee. But instead of going through the normal entrance to this flower, which is somewhat tubular, it breaks or cuts a hole through the side of the flower and steals the nectar without even contacting stigma or anthers or anything like that. And uh, then it's damaging the flower in that case. In the case of a nectar thief, these are firmly established uh, terminologies, by the way, uh, a nectar thief is a mosquito that can't possibly pollinate a plant such as this milkweed flower here because it's got special little gin traps on the side that are that catch the the legs of bees while they're taking the uh, the nectar and mosquitoes are far too light and delicate and they just go and steal the the nectar and get what they want that way but I don't mean to say that all mosquitoes are nectar thieves. And in fact, a recent publication came out questioning the very uh, statement that I made some years ago that they are essentially, with very few exceptions, essentially uh, thieves. But there are some that are really essential pollinators with a very high degree of mosquito plant fidelity. And there are others that contribute to pollination, but are not perhaps essential. The, the most famous example in North America, and by the way, I'm starting out with North American and, and Northern European systems, which are the only ones that have been uh, carefully studied, unfortunately. And this is the ground orchid, Platanthera. And this species, Optusata in particular, puts out an odor, a scent that is very attractive to Aedes and Communis and a few other snowmelt type uh, mosquitoes in northern North America. And they are very good pollinators and partly because the orchid is designed specifically for them, not only for their fragrance, which has a predominance of nonanal in them, which uh, is really attractive to these Aedes. But here at this gateway where the mosquito goes in, there are two pollen packets known as pollinia. They're waiting for it and that stick, they stick to the face of the mosquito while it's in there. And here's a unfortunate mosquito that now has two big packets stuck to its eyeballs and it, it doesn't apparently harm the navigating that the mosquito does and it'll go around to other flowers and those pollen packets will, will burst and go into other flowers. So this is a fairly tight uh, relationship going on here. This is more typically what we see and here's some common examples from uh, the United States where I've uh, looked extensively at these feeding relationships. And here's Edie's Vexans poking around at Queen Anne's lace. Uh, here's one of our Culex, I think it's Culex restuans, uh, uh, drinking nectar from snake root. And here's another Culex male in this case, feeding on goldenrod. And I call these things mosquito flowers. They're so typical. They have short, small, florets, usually in a larger bed of, of, flower, of florets to making up a flower head. And it's very easy to get the nectar even though the mosquito is quite small. Uh, here's one study that has been done fairly recently, just in the past few years, involving tansy, a uh, fish named Tanacetum. And it is a plant that uh, not, not everybody likes. It's sometimes planted on purpose, but it's, as I say, very invasive and fast spreading. It comes from Europe, but it's in many places in, in the new world now. And you can see how pollination can occur 
here, but just looking at this Culex pipiens, uh, hitting one of those flowers and poking around and then getting pollen all over its legs and antennae and proboscis. If it goes from flower to flower, it should be a pretty good uh, pollinator. And uh, Dan Peach and his advisor, Gerhard Gries, in British Columbia have done some elegant little experiments. This is a typical way of doing things uh, where you demonstrate cross-pollination by putting the mosquitoes with some plants uh, and then later transferring them inside a bag to another plant and then seeing what the seed set is. And if the seed set is good, then you can say that this is a potentially good pollinator. But the question is, is it important? I mean, out in the field, it's one thing to do it in the lab, but is it, is it working okay in the, in the field? And I have to say that I need to argue about this with my colleagues in British Columbia, but I think uh, because it visits, that is Culex pipiens, visits lots of other plant species, it must be wasting a lot of pollen. That's not good for the pollen syndrome. And there are many other species of insects also feeding on, on tansy. So that's not good for it. The one thing that might be favoring flower constancy was that these form large patches, these tansy flowers. And so a mosquito can easily go from one to the next. But still my conclusion, my slightly negative conclusion right now is that it's either a minor or unimportant pollinator in the real world. Not that you'd want it to be a good pollinator because uh, it, it'll just choke out other other plants very fast. So, but that's a, a judgment for another day. So now let's switch to Africa. And this is, I, I've spent quite a bit of time, uh, especially in Kenya, but also in, in Tanzania and in Ethiopia. I was in living in Ethiopia for several years. And I was partly stimulated after having stud, studied uh, sugar feeding in North America, intrigued by these statements that uh, Anopheles gambii, one of our most notorious malaria vectors in Africa, is rarely, if ever, feeding on sugar. And I ask you, is that true? And that was a long time ago, 1951. But uh, a little bit more recently, Angus McRae uh, wrote to me with all of his information and said that he thinks that sugar feeding uh, by this species is exceptional. And uh, well, is, that can't really be true, can it? I mean, so many other mosquitoes uh, are sugar feeding, and I've already told you that I figure it's one of the two hosts. Well, one of the first prominent uh, flowers I encountered, I, they were looking at it the day, looking at it at night, no mosquitoes, never on the flowers. The only place where I found mosquitoes feeding was on extra floral nectaries, which are elsewhere on the plant. Just to give you an example, here's a, that was Senna didumabatria. Here's another kind of Senna that, that Anopheles is, is feeding on. And, and this, this big bulbous looking thing is the nectary. Right now, the mosquito is poking around. Uh, here's a, a still a different kind of Senna. And uh, the mosquitoes, you can tell by looking at this, the crop space, it's really filling up on sugar. Now these have very nice flowers, these these uh, plants. They're members of the of the sorry of the uh, the bean family, I should say the the, the leg, their legumes. Uh, 
And some of the flowers are difficult to get into, except for bees, but a lot of them are pretty open to mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes are not going there. To jump over briefly to South America, here's some Wyamaya that are feeding on a extra floral nectary on a juvenile uh, balsa plant. There's, you can't see it very clearly, but there's a line, a glandular line that goes right down the petiole of the, of the leaf. And it, apparently, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the mosquitoes are getting their sugar there. Here's some more. You say, where, where's the gland? I don't even see any gland here. Here's a Culex melanoconian in Panama feeding. They totally ignore the flowers of cashew, but they fill up on sugar on practically invisible glands on the petioles, well below the, the uh, flowers. Same with heliconia. The heliconia forms big, gorgeous flowers that hummingbirds love, but the mosquitoes are more interested in the unopened flower buds. And ants will line up during the daytime to get the nectar from those as well. Well, finally, I found a flower in East Africa where I can see mosquitoes on the flowers. And this is a, you have to wait till nighttime because Anopheles gambi are are all nocturnally active. But Lantana camera, this very common plant used a lot in, um, in landscaping, but it's also considered to be a pest in some places. It's pollinated according to all the literature, chiefly by butterflies, not by mosquitoes. And you can kind of see why if you start looking at it, the, the, the nectar, and also the reproductive parts of the floret here are deep in the tube, deep in the corolla. And the mosquitoes proboscis just can't get down that far, even though to be anthropomorphic, it looks like they're trying to. Here's another one, look how hard it's trying, but it's not getting anything. But you go underneath the flower and you see the mosquitoes actually filling up on sugar from extra floral nectaries that are practically invisible. And I had to search some old literature before I finally found that tiny nectaries have been found on the green parts of lantana. And that's where they're getting their sugar. Well, this isn't helping the cause for pollination at all. Well, I've been doing a lot of wandering around at night and, and getting these impressions, but perhaps a much better method of finding out which plants they're feeding on will come from an indirect method using, uh, in this case, uh, DNA of certain uh, pieces of nucleotide sequence that identify the plant right down to species. And th this is a a nice little study by Vincent Nyasembe and his crew, and including the Baldwin Torto, who's the head of the lab in Nairobi. And you can see from this, this is just a section of an elaborate uh, array of how the various uh, nucleotides sorted out by plant species. And you see Leonotus, 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 Leonotus. You know, I was like, wow, I didn't imagine that this would be a, uh, a potential pollinating plant for mosquitoes. And yet this, these are coming from Anopheles gambii. And it's a peculiar looking plant. It uh, forms a long stalk and it's got these long orange tubes that come out. That's what the flowers are. And Leonotus, if you look at all the literature, it's primarily pollinated by sunbirds, which have long beaks. Well, the only thing I can figure out is that in the spent flowers, the sugar is still down there, a little bit of it, and maybe partly because the sunbirds have been messing up the flower. Uh, there'll be sugar down in these calices, 
underneath the, the flower head. So again, it's not likely to be a good mosquito poll uh, pollinator of Leonotus. What about ricinus, the famous castor bean plant found throughout the world now, probably got started in the Mediterranean. The only obvious places where mosquitoes are getting their nectar is from extrafloral nectaries at the base of the leaf petioles. And yet the DNA shows that ricinus, 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 is, the DNA is being picked up by the mosquitoes. Is the DNA coming from these extrafloral nectaries or are the plants being pierced by the mosquito and it's sucking out phloem sap that has DNA? Uh, still a mystery. One, one more example, and I know quite a bit about this particular plant. This is Parthenium and Parthenium hysterophorus. And the DNA studies show that, again, the mosquitoes are getting DNA from this plant. That's a, a single flower there on the left that Anopheles gambi is uh, probing around on. Here's what it looks like uh, in a, when it's in a pot. It's toxic to livestock. It takes over fields. It spreads rapidly. It produces thousands of seeds per plant. It's not really a welcome plant. It, whoops. And yet, the mosquitoes love it. We've demonstrated this in olfactometers. And mysteriously, it's a very poor source of nectar, but the mosquitoes are all over it anyway. And notice that they might be really good pollinators of Parthenium. Look at all the pollen grains on the proboscis and on the legs, on the antennae even. And if it pollinates well, here's what you get. It's just a field choked with parthenium. So even though it may, the mosquitoes may be good pollinators in this case, but it's not a happy situation. Here's still another one. Uh, this will be my last bad example. Uh, this Prosopis juliflora. It's common in many parts of the drier regions of Africa, both east and west. And it spreads rapidly. It's toxic. It's got thorns. Nobody likes it, but it's, it is it uh, is spreading rapidly and ruining farmland. But it's flowers. They look like real mosquito flowers to me. And the literature says they're pollinated mainly by bees, but also flies and some other things. Nobody has observed. Uh, this is one unfortunate thing is that not many entomologists like to go out at night for whatever reason. So we don't know for sure whether the mosquitoes are feeding on these flowers, but they look like they're, they would be good and they're able to get a lot of nectar from them. But the the plant is, uh, is an unwanted uh, thing. And it's just like uh, Parthenium, it's spreading all over the place and ruining uh, the land according to the people who have to deal with it. So my, my one good example, if you want to call it that, is Acacia macrostachia. Now this one is welcomed by the people who live where it is, uh, mostly in Western Africa, the drier parts, uh, up country in uh, places like uh, uh, Mali and uh, oh, Burkina Faso, places like that. And not only is it used in a lot of traditional medicines, but it's also a good source of food. The beans are are a major part of the diet where this plant lives. This is not a photo I took. I had to borrow this because I've never seen 
Acacia macrostachia, where I've worked. But again, look at its flowers. They look very uh, mosquito-like. That is, it looks like it'd be easy for the proboscises to get down into where the nectar is. And by the way, the, the scent of this flower is rated by Gunter Mueller to be the most attractive of all plants he's studied for Anopheles gambi. But, however, according to the one person who's been out there at night looking at them, and unfortunately, Angus McRae is no longer with us, he's observed at night that the mosquitoes are never on the flowers. They're on extra floral nectaries, and that seems to be where they're getting all their sugar. But this is one person, one set of observations. I don't know if this is true or not. I would love to go back there. And I should say go back there. I'd like to go to wherever this tree is, especially if there are a lot of mosquitoes in the same place, and find out if it's true. Are they really ignoring the most attractive plant and going for the extra floral nectaries? So that's basically the only examples I have for you, but if I if I may make any sweeping generalizations, they may be a little bit harsh, but I would say that possibly mosquitoes are, are sometimes pollinators in the northern latitudes, both in Europe and North America. And if partly they're good because the, they visit them in great numbers in some cases, but nevertheless, they, may be either minor or trivial pollinators because of what I described before, which is that there are too many other insects also visiting their flowers and the potential pollinator itself is visiting a lot of other flowers. But some may be secondary pollinators, uh, you know, actually contribute something. And a very few, like that example of the ground orchid, are actually primary pollinators. So that's a possibly yes. But here's, here's my negative takeaway for now. And that is that, especially among the tropical disease vectors, it's very unlikely that they're playing a, an important role in pollination. There's little or no plant fidelity that uh, anybody can detect. Uh, and there, there are many other insects that are potential pollinators, not just mosquitoes. And oddly enough, the extra floral nectaries seem to supply much, if not more, sugar than the flowers do. And the, some of the best vectors occur at low densities. And in my experience, for example, whether it's daytime or nighttime, I find 10 times as many Culex as I, mosquitoes coming out as I do the malaria vectors and Ophelis gambii and so forth. And they tend to feed infrequently. I, I, I don't take that point as strongly as some people do, but Aedes aegypti and Anopheles gambii and its, its relatives do not feed on sugar as frequently as uh, many of these other more zoophilic uh, mosquitoes do. So my conclusion is that the disease vectors are either minor or unnecessary. And when they do possibly become good pollinators, they're bad invasive species, and, and which is kind of ironic. And therefore, I would have to speculate right now, and this is based on, of course, very limited uh, data, that vector suppression is either going to have no effect whatsoever on pollination, or it might even be a beneficial one. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Woody. And thank you, Nassar, as well. And uh, 
we have some time for questions and uh, I'd like to just get right to it. Um, so, uh, Nisa, I, there's a question for you that that really is uh, that uh, Adriana Costero uh, posted, and, and does the microme affect uh, vector competence? And um, so, maybe could, if you could just say a little bit more about that, or uh, that would be great. Yes, it does affect vector competence, both directly and indirectly. It does affect it directly by um, by activating the muscular immune system in response to uh, pathogen infection and indirectly through oh sorry I thought that my my video was on and indirectly through um, uh, modulating the host uh, life history trait. Okay, great. Uh, so, Woody, uh, there was a question about um, whether or not the uh, the work that you mentioned on uh, Senna and also the Waimea and the Lantana observations, if any, of that's been published. Uh, I have to think about that for a minute. Uh, I would say no. Okay. I've, I've got manuscript and I've got extensive notes where I figure it's not worth a publication yet because uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't have enough uh, data to back it up. But no, a lot of these things, the, the first uh, studies we did involving Senna, which were published by Hortense Manda uh, 15 years ago or so, uh, showing that, that Lantana is a so-so host in terms of attraction and probing and landing, but Senna is a pretty good one. And then in my lab, we've shown that some of these Senna species are very attractive in an olfactometer. And whether they have flowers or not, they're just attracted. In fact, that Senna didymobatria, a common English name for it is popcorn plant, because when you brush against it, it smells like buttered popcorn in a movie theater, weirdly enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but no, this is, in putting it all together, uh, I'm more inspired than ever having seen the Vincent Nyasembe's paper in that group has come out with another one that specifically uh, focuses on Aedes aegypti now too, but Lantana doesn't even show up in their DNA spectrum, mm. but but some of the Senna species do. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, thanks. Uh, Nisa, I've got a question from uh, Stephanie James who asks, uh, are there examples of lateral gene transfer from mosquito to microbe? Yes, there is. I have recently come across um, a publication that suggests that there is one between um, Wolbachia and Aedes, Aedes aegypti. So they have attempted to um, characterize the function of that gene. I don't quite remember what it does in the mosquito, but they do um, they do um, show that it does have a function in the mosquito and um, and in the in the bacteria. I think it's lost or losing its function. Mm -hmm. So the majority of the work on horizontal or lateral gene transfer show or indicate that in the recipient, the, the function of the gene is typically lost. Okay, great. There's, a, there's a, another comment for you or question for you. Um, Megan Quinlan um, is, uh, says that uh, it's just that what you're, you're your, uh, the data that you presented suggests that material transfer agreements need to provide more detail about uh, the source. Um, 
So in, in, in the, like she's referring to the exchange of uh, materials between laboratories, for example, I think. And she, your question is, do you have any comments on, on that? Um, how does the, does the microbiome data that you've presented sort of complicate that in any way? Um, I have not necessarily thought about, about this, um, from that perspective, I don't know that it would. I don't know that it would, it would complicate things, but it's, it, I, I think that it would be useful to have that information, especially if we're considering the effect of uh, the microbiome or, or microbes on mosquito biology and uh, uh, genetics. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. Uh, Woody, I, I want to, here's a question. I think we, we've, we, uh, your, your talk really got at this, but um, uh, maybe just to give you an opportunity to, to, uh, to say more about it is, and the question is, do we have a clear picture in regard to studies done on the number of plant species dependent on mosquitoes for pollination? So um, I guess you gave one an example of, of one really good example of uh, uh, where the mosquito, I wouldn't, or the plant maybe is not dependent upon the mosquito, but certainly is, is, uh, is, is in, in play. Um, I would say you, in the uh, case of the, of the, uh, excuse me, David, in, yeah, in, go ahead. when it comes to the ground orchid, I would say that yeah. uh, it is dependent on yeah. Not on one species of mosquito, but on a small group of, of cold weather, snow melt type uh, mosquitoes going from northern United States through Canada up into Alaska and Northern Territories. The other one that I didn't mention because I didn't want to gobble up too much time is that there's a, a genus Silene or Silene uh, otites in the Netherlands that's been studied. And the argument for that one is that the mosquitoes can be important, if not main pollinators uh, in the area where that's been studied, but only when the mosquitoes are in great abundance. When they're not in such great abundance, the uh, small moths that visit this this plant, uh, Seaside Campion is one of many different names for a cluster of species in the genus Silene. And they seem, I would say, I would put them on a rank right below the orchid in that they are uh, important, if not uh, the most important uh, pollinator of that plant. Yep. Great. There's, there's a comment from one of our, uh, somebody in the audience that, uh, that Lantana is not a native of, of Africa. I think he mentioned that, but uh, just uh, another uh, yeah, nice, I, nice, I, nice flower and we grow them in our gardens. Uh, yeah. Here in the Northeast, we grow them as, as annuals, but, uh, but in Africa, I guess they're, they're not particularly welcome. Uh, yeah, I, I found one thing that said it probably started somewhere in the Mediterranean which covers a very broad area, but apparently this has been distributed around uh, many parts of, of, yeah. uh, of Africa, as mm -hmm. well as most of the Americas. Uh, uh, some people say, no, it really got started in, in Central or Northern South America, which is almost certainly where that noxious Parthenium got started. It was only introduced into uh, Africa, according to some people, around the turn of the last century, around the, the 1900s, it made its way into South Africa and then just spread north. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I've been dealing a lot with invasive uh, weed people and they say it's often impossible to find out where these things actually are native anymore. Yeah. It's just that I've seen loads of lantana in South America, by the way. 
And so uh, I just uh, I just don't know for that one. Mm -hmm. But uh, but everybody seems to agree who studies it, and some people have studied it hard say that butterflies are the main pollinators. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, uh, Nisai. I wanted to get back to you. I, I said something in my introductory remarks about your work on uh, insecticide resistance and microbiome, and uh, you didn't mention anything about that. And I really would love to hear you say a couple words about that. Yeah, I did go back and forth about um, including that here, but decided to um, exclude my work. So yes, I have been working on the role of um, microbes on the evolution of insecticide resistance in um, mosquito vectors for the past six years. And so far we have found strong links between uh, the mosquito microbiota composition and insecticide resistance phenotypes. And we're finding um, consistent result across different geographical locations, across different mosquito species, and across different types of insecticides. So we're, we're finding specific microbes that are um, enriched in association to the different insecticide resistance phenotypes. And in the resistant mosquitoes, we're finding that um, insecticide metabolizing microbes as well as metabolizing microbial genes uh, enriched in this mosquito. So, so far we've only um, focused on the associations between this uh, microbial taxa and microbial genes and my ongoing work is focusing on characterizing their function. So the plan is to conduct in vitro and in vivo tests to figure out what the functions of these microbes and this uh, and whether or not these genes do function in metabolizing um, microbes within mosquitoes. Um, in the susceptible phenotype, we're also finding some really interesting results. We're finding enrichment of um, insect pathogens like serratia, which I believe is um, is the reason for the yeah, susceptibility. So if they're not able to uh, uh, withstand exposure to serratia, then adding another component like uh, insecticide exposure would, um, would further make them less likely to live. So that's another area that we are considering. But in the meantime, we're currently looking at different mosquitoes different mosquito species across different geographical locations to see whether or not we um, would identify the same bacterial taxa or the same microbial taxa as well as um, microbial genetic components that we could use at least for now while we figure out their functions as additional tools for monitoring the evolution of resistance in, in mosquito populations. Oh, great. Thank, thanks a lot. I'm really uh, glad that we had an opportunity to let you tell us tell us something about that. Woody, I got just one uh, one final small question. Uh, we're staring at uh, two beautiful mosquitoes on our screen. Could you say a couple of words about that as I begin to sh as I share my screen over this? I have a few closing remarks to make after you describe what what, what we're looking at there. We're looking at the species Sabethes cyaneus. This particular uh, strain we established from Panama, but it's got a fairly wide distribution. And it's one of a whole uh, tribe of mosquitoes, the tribe Sabathini, the, the more what we call the more primitive ones, made in the air the way most decent mosquitoes do. But but uh, then there are those that, that mate on a substrate. And in the forms that we study, including this cyaneus, uh, they have an elaborate courtship. And what you're seeing here is the first step in the courtship. Uh, I won't point out all the details, but uh, it, the, the male holds on to the 
the wing of the female and pirouettes around to to face her. She's already just there on the twig in this case. And, uh, and then he goes through a whole series of things we, we call free leg waving and then bobbing and then waving and only in, in the final steps do they make genital contact and then he goes through one more elaborate dance and then and only then is sperm transferred between the two. Right now she's in the unreceptive pose because her abdomen is still pointing at his thorax. If she likes what he's doing, I'm being real anthropomorphic here, I'm sorry. Then the abdomen swings down to the point where the, the two genitalia will be uh, possibly in, in contact if things go forward. But she rejects about two thirds, even if she's never made it before, she'll reject about two thirds of the males that uh, court her. So it's a very fussy business. <laughs>